Welcome to the Q&A with Cambridge Creatives with Awa Farah. I'm Fabs, I'm the co-president of Cambridge Creatives. And I'm Tiago, Projects Officer. Thank you for supporting Cambridge Creatives. We're a student-run creative collective curating a series of talks with world-renowned professionals in film, TV and theatre. So please follow our Facebook page to find out more about future events and opportunities. Um, just a couple of housekeeping rules before we begin. If you do have any questions for our guest speaker, please type them into the Q&A function, um, not the chat. It's down here and we'll read them out for you. Um, bear with us if there are any technical difficulties and let us know in the chat if there are any problems with hearing or seeing us and enjoy the Q&A. So to introduce Awa, I'm sure everyone has watched her film, but Awa is the writer and producer of the critically acclaimed documentary Somali Nemo. The film interviews Farah and three other British Somali women about their experience as students at Cambridge. That their discussion explores race, identity and belonging, as well as creating a legacy for the next generation of British Somalis. The film has been recognised by the BAFTA qualifying film festival Aesthetica. We are honoured to have this tra trailblazing filmmaker and Cambridge student speak. Thank you guys. So, thank you. Um, so Awa, when did you uh, first know that you wanted to write and um, be a filmmaker? Um, so I've always been sort of um, interested in storytelling, um, whether that's through sort of writing or research, um, photography, filmmaking, but I guess for me, writing was always more accessible. So that was the easiest way that I could sort of get my stories out there. Um, and so that's why I went on to do research and academia more specifically, and also sort of writing on the side. Um, it was only, I studied journalism um, during my undergrad um, and we did sort of like a course in film journalism and that's sort of where my initial interest definitely um, came to be. Um, but even at that time, actually, I didn't um, sort of actually go into filmmaking straight after. It took me a while to take the steps, I think, to go into that world. How do you think your degree um, prepared you then to make that transition? Um, I think right, it's, it's, writing is very different from filmmaking. I, I think it's actually sort of the polar opposite when it comes to sort of the type of storytelling. Um, filmmaking is very collaborative, which I love. Um, writing is really individualistic you know it's your word it's your work um whereas with filmmaking it's a group of people who are coming together to make something um but i think at the same time when you're a writer and especially sort of like in academia you have a like if you're writing an essay for example you have a thought process and you have sort of like a beginning, a middle and an end that you sort of have in mind. And I think in filmmaking, it's very similar in that sense. Like you have to have a narrative arc. And um, so I think it's definitely helped me in that sense, especially when it comes to sort of like the editing process of filmmaking, you need to know exactly what you want from the story. And there's so much footage that you have to look at and go through that it helps to have that sort of thought process of, okay, this is how I want it to look like. And I think having written so many essays in my life um, has definitely helped and it hasn't been like a hindrance to that process. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, did it feel strange having such a strong academic background to become involved in filmmaking and were there sort of academic questions that you were asking about the filmmaking process? Yeah it did feel strange I mean um, I always thought I would go into filmmaking after academia I didn't think I would do the two together um, and I think coming into this world while also doing academia um, it is quite difficult um, but, you know, that's the good thing about filmmaking and it being such a collaborative process. I think I was able to learn so quickly from people, where, whereas I think if it was sort of a really individualistic thing, that process would have taken me years. 
Um, but because I was surrounded by so many amazing people who really sort of took me under their wing and just um, helped me with any questions I had. Um, and, you know, it's really important to, to like be really curious when you're in those spaces because um, there's so much you need to learn and so much that you can't really learn by yourself. Um, so it was really helpful just being sort of immersed in that field. And um, yeah, I was just really lucky, I think, um, with all the people I was exposed to because I was able to learn so much so quickly. Mm, that sounds amazing. Um, do, would you have any tips then for like students that were trying to transition between sort of academics to um, filmmaking? Um, hmm. I would definitely say, first of all, if you're already thinking about going into filmmaking, um, you've made the biggest step, I think, because it took me such a long time to actually be like, OK, let me actually enter this industry. Um, so the fact that you're already thinking about it, I think the next step is like, I can't stress collaboration enough. Like, I feel like that's always that's all I talk about when I talk about like going into filmmaking. It's just try to work with as many people as possible as early on as possible um whether that's directors or producers um cinematographers um editors like anyone you can work with work with because that is all part of the process of filmmaking is is working with all of those people and it is stages you know you work with a director if you're a producer or if you're a producer you work with a director and then you um, work with a cinematographer and then you end up working with an editor in the sort of um, editor suit. So you need to be able to do those things. And I think if you have experience in it, it'll make it easier. Um, so yeah, I would definitely stress just um, being in those environments as much as you possibly can be. Mm. When was like the moment then that you switched and were like, do you know what? I want to do filmmaking. Was there like a particular time that you were thinking about it more than before I think when I finished my master's um and I had this idea for Somali Nemo and I had been sitting on it for a while and I knew I wanted to make a film about it but it was very much like oh I have essays to do I have you know my dissertation to do I have so much to do and so now I had this time and it was during the summer holidays, I remember when I literally was just writing my dissertation, finishing off. And I thought, this is the time for me to actually actualize this and make something into this. And I just took the first step and I was like, let me just actually start working on this. Um, and then I got in contact with Alice, the director. And yeah, I think ever since then, it was like once I actually started, I just... I couldn't stop so I feel like for that two years all I was doing was just working in film um and it's only now that I've actually sort of allowed myself to breathe a little bit but yeah so um on Somali Sam Nemo then where did the idea for the film first come from so during my time during my master's um, I was just involved in so many, I was in so many amazing spaces, um, so many amazing communities that are sort of like outside of traditional Cambridge communities. Um, so like Fly was one, um, which is like a society. The Somali society as well. I remember we had one, a particular event that stands out to me was um, we had a Somali society event towards the end of the year. And we were all like in traditional Somali clothing, listening to Somali music. And we were in this like really traditional Cambridge room. And it was just sort of like, even at that time we were saying, this is such a like interesting contrast of like cultures, I guess. Um, but sort of like merging beautifully in this space. And I remember at that time thinking, wow, I would love to sort of take inspiration from this moment. And also I think more generally, um, Growing up, Somali was always depicted in a in a bad light. And I think we didn't have a lot of representation in the media or in film, but when we were in film or media, it was never positive. And I think from a really young age, I was really aware of that. And I remember thinking, oh, this is so unlike 
the experience of myself, my family and my friends. So I, I wonder why the stories are being told like that. Um, and so I think I realized that if I wanted to see a positive story, then I would have to tell it or we would have to tell those stories for ourselves. And Somali Nima was never really about, I think it wasn't essentially about like telling a positive story. It was just about telling an authentic story and our story. And um, it just happened that it was one that people saw as being, you know, something really inspirational and something really positive, which is great. Yeah, a hundred percent it is. Um, when did you decide that you wanted to relate that story and, you know, bring that authenticity? When did you decide that you wanted to do that in, in film? Um, I think I always wanted to sort of see a visual representation of my, like parts of my identity. Um, I think it's one thing writing about it and one thing actually seeing it. You know, we always say you can't be what you can't see. And I think there's power in visual storytelling. And I, so I, I for, for a long time, I've wanted, whether that was through photography or filmmaking to tell stories, especially unheard stories um, through sort of like visual means. Um, but it was only, I, I guess for me, Somali Nimo just made sense in, in a film format. rather Because we did actually think about making like a photography series or something like that. But there was just so much to the story that um, we sort of always kind of knew that we wanted to make a film. Um talking about how it would how do this is just out of curiosity how would you have envisaged it as a photography project how what were you going to focus on if you'd done that so we didn't actually think about it too deeply it was it was something that we sort of initially when we first met it was something that we thought about um but I guess we would have just had the Somali women in traditional Somali clothing around really sort of like um Cambridge spots in Cambridge you know um so that's and also the Somali living room scene was something that was um really essential from the beginning like we always knew that we wanted to have that Somali Somali living room scene I mean Som the Somali living room is so quintessentially Somali like there's nothing else like it um you know the curtains and the honestly like the incense burning in the home that was one of the first things we had on the sort of mood board. We're like, yeah, this is going to be it. So I think we would have also included that in the photography. Um, so it would have just been really just photography version of the film, I think, um, which we ended up getting anyways because of the stills, um, because it was so beautifully shot, I think. And Alice, you know, was amazing um, in terms of her sort of... Um, vision for that I was gonna say like the shots anyway could be photography they're so like stunning um you've spoken a bit in articles about in Somala Nemo about carving a home away from home in Cambridge which is obviously a traditionally white male space how did you go about making that in your MPhil and also how did what was you spoke a bit about sort of like being in a traditional Cambridge room with playing Somali music but what was what were the things that you wanted to capture like spatially if that makes sense yeah, so I did want to capture sort of that traditional Cambridge space because obviously that's the main part of the experience. But then we also wanted to capture how you can come into these spaces and bring yourself fully. Like the fact that we were in traditional Somali clothing is not just something that we wanted to represent just for the, for the sake of it being a film. It's actually something that we did in these spaces. You know, we would go to formal halls in traditional Somali clothing. Um, one of the first formal halls I went to actually was the ACS um, formal hall um, and the African Caribbean Society formal hall. And I wore Somali traditional clothing. And so, these were things that actually happened and these were all real representation of our experiences and also another element that was super important for us was 
the idea of sisterhood. And I don't think we could have done this film, you know, well, just me. Because as initially it was just going to be me um, featured in the film. But then after talking about, you know, my experience and how much the other women had an impact on my experience, it would be almost ridiculous just to have me on there by myself. And so that that um, feeling of sisterhood um, was really, really important to represent throughout the film. And I think it does come across that like these spaces became a you know home away from home because of the women that I had around me and also because of like that support system. Um, and my Cambridge experience wouldn't have been the same without them. Mm. Going to that idea of sisterhood then, it comes across really strongly that you have a sort of shared experience with um the four girls well you including within the four girls um how how did you f like find them was it quite a natural process where you already knew them and then yeah. one of the person that applied to Cambridge and eventually got in was it sort of like a just people word of mouth recommendations or was it sort of like a persistent effort to find people no actually it was really really easy to find people because I knew all of them, except for obviously um, Samia, who hadn't applied yet, who was applying at the time. And she she was friends with Hafsa, so it was super easy. And I actually met Hafsa and Samia at a, again, an ACS event panel, and they were at the front just, and I remember hearing them speak and just thinking like, wow. So I knew Hafsa already, so I went up to her afterwards and I thought, and I asked her, I said, Hafsa, are you interested in sort of being included in this? And I would love your friend as well to be included in this. But her friend was like, I don't go here. <laughs> and I remember, and it, but she mentioned at the time that she was applying and I thought that's enough. Like that's because you're so <laughs> articulate and so amazing. Like I just wanted her um, in the film, but her story ended up being such a fundamental part of the whole story actually. Whereas at the time I think I was just being a bit selfish and just thought <laughs> I really like this girl and I just want her in the film. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just, it worked out really, really well. And we were able to put at the end of the film that she got in and it was just a really nice story arc. Um, but yeah, I knew, I knew Miss Ski before as well. With, um, Hafsa in particular, she's so incredibly articulate. Were there anything, well, they were all incredibly articulate. Um, but were there any moments where they said something that you hadn't expected or anticipated, but made a lot of sense and resonated with you? Um, I don't think there was anything that was sort of like said, actually there was so much, so many things that were said that we just were so similar. I think that sort of what shocked me was just how similar our experiences were. Um, anything that anyone would mention is like, oh my God, yes, like that's exactly what I experienced as well, especially when we're talking about like our childhood and growing up sort of made me think, did we all live the same life? Like it was really weird, like freaky. Um, but I think one topic that came up that we weren't expecting was this topic around the civil war. And mm -hmm. that was something that we didn't even, that was one of the things that I hadn't anticipated to be a part of the film because I just thought, um, you know, it's not really necessary to the story, but it turned out to be so necessary because mm -hmm. it was like, sort of like the thread that was holding everything together almost like we will always come back oh the reason we're here is because of this thing and you know the reason our parents feel this way is because of this civil war thing and it was like everything always came back to that and obviously for people who don't know Somali history and know why we're here in this country and stuff like that it was an essential part of the story too um so that was something I think that was one of the things that I hadn't anticipated to be in the film, but ended up being in the film. Mm. Um, going back to what you said about um, Alice being a really, like the perfect director to kind of, to represent all of this and to help you um, like bring it to, um, to reality. How did you, how did you like find someone like that? Like what was the process for it? Yeah, so I actually came across Alice's photography work um, on, so she photographed, two Somali women in this photography series and she also did photography work in Somaliland which is where my mom is from on the drought that was happening during the time 
but it was just like a really beautiful photography work really putting like the human aspect at the forefront rather than like talking about like this is all the sad stuff that's happening this month you know and it was just it was something that resonated with me and I remember seeing it and thinking like wow I would love to apply this sort of like um I guess mine to like uh, what I'm trying to do with Somali Nemo um and so I got in contact with her and she was the only director I got in contact with actually and yeah, yeah. and I just thought let me just see like if not I can always try to look for someone else who I'm like inspired by but I just wasn't coming across anyone at the time that I thought was fit for the project um and so she contacted me back and it just it just from then we just met up and yeah the rest is history I guess that's such a nice like way for it all to come together what was the like collaborative process like you said it was your first like formal film so how, how did you find it working with the director like that yeah and this was Alice's second so at the time when we first met she hadn't directed anything actually she, so oh, this wow. is the second um thing that she was directing and so we were both sort of like newbies in this world um and so to answer the question of how was that collaborative process it was really a in the true sense of the word a collaboration like it wasn't like she's the director I'm the writer and producer you stay in that field I stay. it was like everything we did together um and from the start we just developed the story together and when we were filming you know we were working together um so every aspect um we both had a say in and we both really listened to each other and you know we didn't always agree on everything but I think we really had a similar communication style and it was very easy for us to find a middle ground or be like oh no actually you're right about this one and I think Alice what I really loved about Alice was she was um she really understood that this was like a personal project for me and that even as a director you know if I saw a certain shot didn't really fit with the style that we were trying to make and the film that we were trying to make she would be like okay yeah I understand that and we'll change it you know so it wasn't it, it never felt like someone was filming it for me you know it felt like I had a say in every part of the project which I really um that's how I want to work like that's the only way I want to work in the future because um yeah it was really great that sounds incredible were there any like sticking points where you're like this is the one thing not the one thing but like this is something that I'm not willing to budge on was there any like core aspects of the story hmm I think actually coming back to what I said earlier it was the civil war thing um Mm. it took a while I don't know maybe it's because I was sort of really stuck on the what I had already written and what I wanted for the story and what I wanted the story arc and storyline to look like um and also yeah I just had a very specific idea and I think that was the only thing that was sort of like not really it and it took me a while to sort of truly understand um why that was important and I think the thing that sold me was really just knowing that like I was very much like, oh, I'm making a film for the Somali community. And just knowing that like, no other people are gonna watch this and they don't know anything about Somalia or the civil war that happened. That was sort of what made me realize, yeah, actually we do need to mention some things here or else it's just gonna be some random girls at Cambridge University walking around with (laughs) traditional (laughs) Somali clothing. Um, Yeah, no, it's so beautifully conveyed as well. talking about sort of like the filmmaking process and being super collaborative how did you and Alice go about getting funding because it's often the biggest hurdle to get over in any filmmaking process yeah so funding was not easy um so we were working on this project exactly for two years actually when it came out and we initially got funding um in the first year we got funding from a company I won't mention <laughs> just because they were trash um, and they funded us and then they sort of we 
sent them more stuff and they said, oh no, we can't fund you because this is too political for us. And so we sort of had to back out. <laughs> well, we didn't have to back out. They literally threw us out. Um, and heck? yeah, that was really disheartening because we were so passionate about this project and they wanted to change a few things and we just weren't happy. We, we knew exactly what we wanted to make at that point because it was like a year in. Mm -hmm. And so we just thought, oh no, it's fine. Like even if we have to pay our own money towards this you know save up money over a few years we'll do it like that's how much we wanted to make it um and then it was exactly I think six months seven months about after that that we got the doc society funding which was so nice because they just let us sort of um they just gave us the space to create what we wanted without being really um, interfering but at the same time being so supportive like literally till this day I call up um, <laughs> like Hannah um, who's part of the Doc Society team and I'm like hey I'm really I don't get this part and she'll literally just give me advice like they are the most amazing funders ever and they just support their um, trustees so much so yeah we were really really lucky to get them to fund Somali Nemo. Uh, you said that so like um, like unfortunately by the point you kind of like really formulated what you the idea that you wanted to um convey in the film you had the um the, uh, the like sponsors pull out um were there still a lot of like changes as you know production funding went on to the film or or did you find that you had always the idea like quite um you always held it kind of at the front at the you know front of your mind like from the beginning yeah I think we always had the story idea and we always had we always knew where we wanted to film from the beginning so Pembroke College um, was one of the first former halls I went to and um, we knew we wanted to film at a mosque for example we knew that we wanted to film at Wolfson um, we knew that we wanted to film that S Somali living room scene we knew sort of like what we wanted to do in those spaces. But as I said, like you can't predict a lot of these things and especially because it is a documentary and we're literally interviewing three well, four women, including myself. And, you know, those interviews were completely not, you know, they were real. And so we were asking those questions and whatever came out of those interviews was what we were gonna put in the film, you know, because we don't have anything else. Um, but it just happened that like, I, I guess being a Somali woman myself, I had an idea of what that experience looked like. And so it was quite easy for me to frame that before the interviews and for me to get an idea of what we wanted. And yes, some things changed, but it wasn't anything to like drastically change the story or anything like that. But I will say at the beginning, we were going to do, um, Somali identity in London we weren't even going to do Cambridge it was only through interviews in the initial interviews Alice and I did just us two um that I just I was always talking about Cambridge like especially because I just graduated at that point I was like oh you know what this happened when I was in Cambridge and she was like yeah I think we're making a story about Cambridge and Somali identity at Cambridge I was like yeah I think we are um so in terms of that, from the initial stage, I think there was a lot of changes, but towards the end, it was very much, I think, set. So not a lot had changed. It's really, it's almost ironic that, um, you know, being in Cambridge, which is as a space traditionally not um, really like accessible in that way, um, that that's where I guess the visibility um, aspect comes out the strongest and it's what, is where you wanted to base the film and your experience there. Yeah, I think Cambridge is such a, I would say such a good backdrop to like um, talks about identity. Like, yeah, we could have filmed it in London, but London is like, there's so much happening in London and it's- So multicultural. I, yeah, it was so multicultural, just sort of like in, in, invisible and, and Cambridge is like where your identity is heightened um so it is uh, it is an interesting place to sort of see that contrast but I always say it's like a merge of the two worlds it's not a contrast it's like we're here all coming together sharing this space and 
you know, you hear, you've, we've seen so many stories about like elitist Cambridge students um, at Cambridge, you know, and it's like, that is the story you think about when you think of Cambridge, but it's like there's, there's so many other stories and why can't we share those as well? Yeah, I completely agree. Um, with when you when I was watching the documentary, you do end in London. I think it's Shepherd's Bush Market. I think I yeah. live right around the corner from that. It was really weird. Oh, um, cool. But um, was that did, was that an important sort of sticking point that you ended the arc from? I'm guessing most people were from London, sort of like back at home and feeling like in where people felt at home. Yeah, so we're all from London, um, and. I grew up in Shepherd's Bush as well hey. and Samia grew up in Shepherd's Bush as well so um and there's so many Somali people in Shepherd's Bush you probably know so it was just it seemed um yeah I just spent a lot of time in that market and and yeah I guess it, it was it was a perfect contrast to sort of like that Cambridge space especially when we're talking about not feeling at home I think Shepherd's Bush is definitely something that represents a place where I feel at home and where we feel at home and you know even us walking through that market I don't know if you can tell but like no one is even looking like people are so busy and there's so much stuff going around we have a massive camera we have so many people around us and yet people are just like they don't see you and then you come to Cambridge and it's like the lit the teeniest bit of a difference it's like it stands out um but yeah, no, it was really nice to, and we filmed in a Somali restaurant as well, where we're eating and Somali food, um, which was really nice. They were really lovely. They let us film in there and yeah. Yeah. Um, that was one thing that I thought was really beautifully done where in Cambridge, you have the people staring down the camera lens being sort of almost a bit hostile towards that. And then when you come to London, it just felt so open and accepting and it was actually really beautifully conveyed. Um, how did you come, to the name of Somal and Nemo then? Was that something that you had at the story's core or did it develop over time? Mm. So Somal and Nemo, um, yeah, it was the initial name we had for it because it means um, it means Somaliness, the essence of being Somali. And it's something, it's a word that's used a lot in the Somali community. Um, I guess it's used a lot like in terms of, um, it's used a lot towards the second generation of Somalis, the people who were born here and raised here, because I think our parents typically say, oh, they've lost a sort of sense of their Somali nemos, Somali nemo, and a sense of like the essence of being Somali, because, you know, obviously um, you've just been here longer and maybe you don't speak the language as well and you haven't been back home as much. So Somali nemo, that word to me was always interesting. Anytime I heard um, conversations around it, I, I always found it really fascinating just like looking in and hearing that conversation um, and so I I was really passionate about I guess representing a new version of Somali Nemo a version that's like never talked about you know just like students I guess um, Somali women um, second generation at a sort of elite university um, I thought it was really interesting just to showcase that like there is no one way of being Somali you know and I don't think you can ever lose your Somali nemo like that that whole idea always sort of irked me even you know if you can't speak the language or I think being Somali is just it's a part of you no matter what so I wanted I was really passionate about sort of representing that idea mm. and with that idea have you shown it to sort of like your parents your wider family do they recognize how that idea is perhaps you've like owned it and taken it and given it a new meaning yeah so I actually showed my family first before I showed anyone else um like during the editing stage and yeah they loved it and I think I come from a really big family um I have like six older sisters I say like as if I don't know <laughs> <laughs> I have si I do have six older <laughs> sisters um and yeah they're like my biggest supporters and my biggest critics so if they liked it I'm like I don't really care what anyone else thinks I think that was my mentality and so I showed it to them and they were like oh this is this is really cool and I was like okay that's the green light I need <laughs> um so yeah I think I think especially as I said because there's been so much like 
negative stereotypes towards Somali people, um, they really saw that as being, this film as being something new and something different and something positive, which always makes me happy. Apart from uh, finally getting like recognition from your older sisters, like which part of the like impact of the film were you most um, excited by? I'm really excited by the fact that it's reached such a wide audience. As I said at the beginning, I think I initially thought, oh, it's just for the Somali community and they're probably maybe going to like it. But then not only do they like it and not only have I received so many messages of people just saying like, oh, thank you so much for making something like this. Like, it's so nice to see ourselves represented in a positive light. But I've received messages from people like literally from all types of backgrounds um, saying that they resonate with the story, which I think is so interesting because I guess I just, I don't know their story. So for the fact that they resonate with it, and find it inspiring and people um yeah just like watching it with their families and friends like all of that is just so nice and I think also it's sort of testament to the power to the power of social media um I think because it was like the guardian audience um that would have seen it only I guess if it wasn't for social media it wouldn't really have reached the type of audience I think that watched it the most um, so I'm really, really grateful. You touched on your the relationship with The Guardian. How did that come about? Were there any people that you reached out to or was it quite sort of a natural sort of process? Um, I wonder what you mean by natural. <laughs> um, it was, I guess, natural in the sense that we, we, did, we finished the project. People think that The Guardian got involved um, I've had a few people asking me if The Guardian got involved initially, but actually it was only when we finished the project that we got in contact with um, the head of um, film, um, Charlie, and we sent him our, our film and he got in contact basically saying that he was interested in it. So yeah, that's how it sort of came to be. And it was very, it was towards the end, it was around July this year oh, wow. that they took it on. So it was once we finished the film, but it can work the other way around as well. You can get sort of funded by The Guardian while you're um, making the documentary, but that's a different process. Um, oh, sorry, I lost my face. Um, what was the thing that you wanted to be at the heart of the story? Was there something that you, you if you could summarise it in a sentence, what was sort of like the purpose of it? I think it was to showcase um, a story about four Somali women owning their identity in a space that's not typically seen as being for them. Um, and I would like to think, because, you know, when we were making it initially, the, one of the first things I said was, I just want to make something I wish I had when I was like a teenager growing up in London, like something I could watch and be like, wow, like that's sort of inspirational, not necessarily like, oh, I want to be like them or I want to go to Cambridge or whatever, but more like, oh, wow, like these people are from the same background as me. Um, and it's just something I never had, not something I never saw. And that's sort of what I always had in mind when I was making it was like, I just want like a 14 year old girl to be, 14 year old Somali girl to watch this and be like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> And that was enough for me, but you know. Um, it's really interesting the fact that you said that um, people pulled out the funding because they thought it was too political when like that's the only intention about it. It's like, it's such a shame that to like to make that say, statement is, um, you know, to be political. So do you think where do you think the industry can can do better in that way about um you know a diversity of representation like where do you think the responsibility lies with um improving in the next generation i think yeah i think the change should come from within um 
and I mean that in terms of there should be more people who are deciding what to fund, you know, from different backgrounds. It shouldn't just be sort of one type of person, but times 10 sitting in a room, um, all deciding what films to fund, because at the end of the day, you're just going to fund the same thing over and over again. You know, you need a diversity of ideas and it always comes from behind the scenes. Um, and I think that's why it's so important not just have diversity like in front of the camera. Um, in terms of Somali Nimo, like it could have very much been like an all white car, like an all white um, team making Somali Nimo, right? But it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been what it turned out to be because you need you need a diversity of thought. Um, and I think if there was more diversity behind the scenes, it would. Um, reflect on screen and so we wouldn't need to sort of make so much fuss about diversity because it will just be a natural process the way um, having a majority sort of like white um, um, films is nowadays it, it would have been the same if it was um, if it was other around so I think it's just changing that and changing things from within and then that can sort of like reflect outwards and we don't need to like always be talking about, oh, we need more, more diversity, we need more diversity because it's like, that's what's already happening naturally. Was that something that you focused on when you were choosing who your cinematographer was? Were you like, we really need to make this a diverse cast that understands the story that we're telling? Oh, definitely. Like every aspect of it. And we had a all female cast, and not, keep saying cast, we had an all female team as well um, because we 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 had a we wanted to create a sense of comfort, especially because we're working with Muslim women, um, and you know if we're sitting around in a in a living room, we want to be comfortable, and we don't want to be thinking about like oh, um, you know I need to you know wear something else, and you know so. It was part of every process and even like the makeup artists, you know, thinking about being someone, um, a woman of color, just so that she knew sort of more um, experience working with um, black women. Um, yeah, we, it was part of every aspect of um, the film for sure. That's amazing. Um, going back to sort of like the living room scene that you just touched on, um, that was, incredibly beautiful and cinematographically came across so well what when you were physically making it what did you want to bring into it and were there any particular like was it just visual or there was one I think you referenced the smell of the room was there were there things that you thought were like essential in order to cultivate a true living room in the way that you'd imagined oh yeah so we had the curtains which were the number one thing because if you walk past a Somali household we always joke that like you know if it's a Somali house because of the curtains and so we always knew there was a specific look for the curtains and the unsi which is the incense that was burning as well that there's a scene of it as well which you see it burning um and the tea like us pouring the tea yeah. um was something really important the carpet every aspect and also like the seating on the floor it's called Fadi Saudi and it's like a lot of Somali households have that rather than like couches. Um, so yeah, it was, it, so much love went into creating that living room um, and a lot of time and it was really stressful, I'm not gonna lie, but <laughs> it, was, it was really, really worth it. And I think when I think back at Somali Nemo, like that is by far my favorite part of it. It's just, not only creating it but also sitting in it and speaking in it with the girls and literally we were there for hours just chatting and we're like oh yeah we're being filmed I completely forgot it was just that comfortable like it it, it really did feel like home and actually a funny story we didn't show the girls the living room so they were getting makeup done and getting dressed and stuff and we had it all closed up so the scene where we do walk in, I had already seen it, I had to pretend, but <laughs> it was actually the first time they saw it. Oh and they were like, wow, this is so cool. Um, yeah, so we kept that hidden from them until then. <laughs> Just a quick follow up on the living room then. So did when they entered it, were they like, this is uncannily like 
what I imagine home to be. Yeah, so that reaction you see in the film was just a short clip, but they were like, how did you get all of this? <laughs> like, they're like, where did you go? Like, there was like, literally every aspect um, was there. So we, it, we even had like little ornaments and stuff around it. I didn't think it comes across, but it was just so important for me to have it actually for like a living room. Cause I, I wanted us to sit in there and speak and we didn't have any of that stuff rehearsed so it was just like the topics that came up and those topics came up so authentically um, because of how comfortable we and there was how comfortable we felt and there was so much um, that we didn't put in but actually it's a shame because it was a short film and I think we had so much footage but there was so much we talked about during that time that was so sort of like personal and I don't think we would have talked about it if it was just like um, or sitting in front of a camera or speaking to the camera the same way that we did during the interviews. Mm -hmm. Was there anything that people went into that was quite personal that they didn't want? Did they like edit it after and say, actually, I, w I said something that I don't want people? Was, it, was there like a level of privacy to it? Oh yeah, definitely. There was a few things that um, were mentioned that they were like, oh, can we not put that in there? We're like, you know, we won't. Like, it's not a big deal. You know, we have so much footage um and even I think there was things during that time in the living room, in the living room that we spoke about that I even was like okay like let's stop for that in like that's just like digressing too much you know mm -hmm. um but yeah we definitely respected anyone's um anything they didn't feel comfortable having in there like understandably so there, there was so much we talked about during the interviews and like all the other sort of like bits that we did that it's all it's it's natural for someone to say, okay, let's not put that in there. You know, it's like, obviously that's gonna be a part of it. Um, and so we had that in mind when we were like filming as well. Mm -hmm. uh, looking forward then, Awa, is, is there anything that we can expect soon or are you gonna take the time to, um, you know, relax a bit after all of the attention from Samala Nima? So, yeah, I just finished actually working um, literally a few weeks ago, working on a project with um, the director, Kevin McDonnell, um, on a feature film called A Life in a Day. And yeah, that was a lot. It was over 4,500 hours of footage that we had to go through. Um, and it's about different lives across the world that's going to be put into one film. And it's really, really powerful and an amazing visual story. And that's going to come out in January. I say January as if it's three months from now. I'm just going to come out next month um, on Sundance Film Festival. So that's really exciting. Does that mean you get to go to Sundance? Because that sounds really cool. If, if there wasn't a um, pandemic going on, so Sundance is going to be online this year. Oh. So it's a bit different. Um, but I'm just happy to have been a part of such an amazing project. Yeah. Um, yeah. That sounds incredible. Um, do you have any projects that you've sort of like had ideas for that you're happy to tell us about, like in the future that you're, you'd make yourself or are you keeping your cards close to your chest? I think at the moment I'm just I'm exploring and I'm sort of just excited by what I might do in the future I really want to work on my uh, work on my first feature film for sure um soon and yeah I might be working towards that <laughs> just getting the ideas yeah are we allowed to know like what theme that would be on are you just waiting so I'm always um, interested in the theme of like personal stories. Like I love anything per and I love like um, making personal stories into like really beautiful stories. Like I think oftentimes we hear a lot of like, um, I guess, serious stories and it's very, it feels very serious when you're watching it. But I, I just like the, I like, I like beautiful films and I think every genre should have beautiful films mm. that definitely came across in Somal and Emo as well perfect <laughs> <laughs>
Um, would you say our the also um, I don't know because because for me like you have such a strong like academic background like probably Fels and I both as students like really look up to you like that. Um, it's so interesting to see you like bring out lived experience um, into Marlin Nimmo. Um, do you feel like that there's ways that your like academic experience is going to contribute more to it in the future? Like more explicitly, I guess, like for your filmmaking? Um, yeah, I think so. I think knowledge always contributes to anything, you know, and having, you know, I read a lot of I read a lot of stuff and um, especially as a sociology student, you know, the topics that I'm reading and the theories that I'm reading are not, they're not completely out of touch with the work that I'm doing as a filmmaker. You know, they always help me and they always make me, um, I think a stronger filmmaker more than like sort of um, making me being a sort of detriment to the work that I'm doing for sure. Um, and there's so much work that I'm inspired by, like through what I read, that always gives me ideas um, for filmmaking. Um, so I think the two work hand in hand. And I think it's just the way you approach these things. Like, yes, we're like students and we have sort of like tight deadlines and things like that. But I think if the work that you do, if it doesn't inspire you, then um, it's probably probably not what you want to be doing in the future probably the wrong yeah <laughs> probably the wrong person. um going from sort of like the student aspect to sort of like cambridge in general what's the reception been like for Samala nemo in Samala nemo sorry in cambridge generally um have your tutors watched it mm. so i so my supervisor has i know um He's very supportive and he messaged me after he came out congratulating me and stuff. Um, I'm not really sure about my college too. Like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like I haven't heard anything. I know Wolfson for sure. Like they're really proud. And I think it's because I, I guess I've been more vocal about like being a Wolfson student. Like even you asked me at the beginning, are you a Wolfson student? So I think people just assume I am. And so they have been really, really supportive. And we even did a talk with them. Um, in, I think it was October um, and so they they have been really supportive and yeah everyone in the sort of like my department have been supportive um, so the, the reception has been really really good actually like and I always say it's not I don't I hope that like people don't watch Somali Nemo and think oh this is telling like this is showcasing bad on Cambridge I don't think it is I think it's just you know um a story that's just never been told before and it's very much topics that have been discussed at Cambridge like I know firsthand that this is like what a lot of minority students talk about mm -hmm. um so it's our experience and it's not it was never meant to be like um an indictment of Cambridge you know um it was supposed to showcase the diversity of Cambridge and showcase our culture and as I said, you know, Cambridge just happens to be sort of like a backdrop to, for that, but it's not necessarily like the main story. Um, looking forward to like post-corona and what the world's going to look like, um, what do you think the like creative landscape's going to be like in a few years time? Do you think it's going to give a lot of space to sort of stories like the ones you're telling or do you, yeah? You probably, this is also quite quite like an academic question, so you might just be like, I, I don't <laughs> No, I hope so. I think that's my answer. I hope so. And, you know, with this year has been such a crazy year. And I think, I hope that we learn from this year and not move on from it as in like, we don't see it as being a moment. And like, that was 2020, like, while well, we did a lot for black people. <laughs> Let's just move on now. Um, mm -hmm. I hope it's um, something that's made us all think and all aware of what's really happening in the world, you know, and how much needs to change. And I think we are on this path now and it's the right path. So I, I, I think the way we're going now 
it's only right for us to see more stories like this because it was given opportunities to people who never had it before. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm excited for the future of filmmaking. I, I've already, you know, I'm already seeing so much coming out now, which is so amazing. And it's so like, just exciting to see um, and inspiring. That's such a lovely thought to wrap up the talk bit of the Q&A with. Um, we're going to take questions from our audience members now. Um, but our final question, whilst people type out their questions into the question box, do people, uh, do you have any TV or film recommendations um, to fill our lockdown terms and Christmas vacation? Ooh, that's a good question. I really, this is super random, but like I, I'm saying it because it really inspired Somali Nemo. Um, there is a short film by the filmmaker Yumna El Arashi, and she's a London based filmmaker um, called, I believe it's called 99 Names of God. And it's just a really beautiful cinematic piece. And it's on Nowness on YouTube if you want to watch it. And it's absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. And she's an amazing artist to begin with. And she's, her work is amazing, but that f- short film in particular is, it's really, really amazing. If you just want to watch something and not really have to like think, but you just want to like get immersed into this like beautiful cinematic style that I would definitely recommend that. Definitely put that on my list. Um, do you have, this is a Q and A question. Um, do you have any, I uh, uh, like, would you, if you were, wait, sorry, I've lost the question. Um, do you, oh yeah, do you, how did you go about writing something that was being um, interviewed and balancing out both strands? Yeah, so I think it was always about just having the story up and not really imposing anything too much on like what people were going to say. So I, I left that up for um, just natural conversations to happen. But I think for me, the story aspect of things was like, how the story was going to look like you know like we're going to go to Cambridge we're going to film here this is sort of the the conversations we're going to have in this space this is then where we're going to end it we want to have a conversation in this space too and it was just for me that process was really what I talk about when I'm speaking about writing um I think the worst that was said by you know the other girls of course it's their words and like nothing was imposed on them but um, the storyline was very much there from the beginning. Um, there's another Q&A question that we have. Um, what was the lowest point of the whole filmmaking process, kind of from start to finish in those two years? I would say definitely that funding experience we had was really tough. Um, but also coronavirus, like the uh, finishing, finishing off the project, um, while COVID was happening was really tough because um, we had luckily finished the filming in January so that was really lucky but then we had just started the editing stage and it was super difficult because everything was locked down and we couldn't travel and stuff so it was a really weird way of trying working with editors and stuff um, and we also had I always say leave a lot of space for editing because it is the most difficult part of filmmaking. The rest is honestly enjoyable. Um, The editing part, for me at least, was so stressful and it took such a long time. And it was, we had to change editors as well because we had issues with one of the editors. Um, And so, yeah, there's so much that happens during the editing stage that you can't can't account for. Um, You just need to have, leave out time and, leave out some brain space as well because you're going to need it um just to go through all the footage and knowing that you have to leave so much footage behind um yeah because I was saying you know I had a story already planned out and stuff but then when you have all that footage in front of you it's it takes a lot out of you so definitely um I would say those two editing and funding beginning and end (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, 
I think that's all we had time for. I'm sorry for people that have submitted questions that we haven't had time to answer. We did run over a little bit in terms of the main talk. Thank you, Awa, for your wonderful answers and for giving us your time. Thank you to everyone who joined the call and asked such amazing questions. And please like our Facebook page for uh, more updates and opportunities. Um, we've just announced our screenwriting competition, which you can find out more about on our website. And as always, we're always open to applications to write reviews as well. The next Q&A is next Thursday on the 10th at 7 p.m. with writer and director Daniel York Lowe. And you can sign up for the event on Facebook. Thank you so much for coming, Awa, and we hope everyone had a lovely talk. See Thank you guys you later. so much.